theme of today's gospel readings is that it is God's garden, that the kingdom of God is his garden, and that he is the one who gives the growth. Uh, let's please stand. Welcome to our French Sunday service. Today is not a communion service, we will have lunch after the service, uh, agape meal, as the early Christians used to say. Uh, so that will be our communion, our lunch together. Uh, so do please stay for lunch. Let me preach you. The Lord be with you. And I'll also be with you. Let us uh, sing our opening hymn, Sound of the Saints. Um, the season of the Spirit. 
And we heard a couple of weeks ago how the theme of, um, Jesus is Lord. Uh, and then last week the theme was spiritual warfare. Uh, and we looked at principles of spiritual warfare. This is in the, in the set readings, the lectionary. And today the theme is that God's kingdom is a garden and that he's the gardener. So it's Jesus is Lord. We're in a spiritual battle. But the garden belongs to him. And it's him that makes the garden grow. So we don't have to stress that we're under spiritual battle and that we have difficulties to face because he's the one who causes the garden to grow. And today we have the shortest parable in the New Testament. The shortest parable. It's the parable of the growing garden. And what it says is the garden grows all by itself. And have a look around you. Here you are, you're all plants, some of you are rhubarb, some of you are asparagus, some of you are fruit trees. We're all plants in God's garden. And we all grow spiritually uh, as God pours his light and, and, and plants his seed in us when we grow. And you're not here because I did anything. Ethan's not here because I've done anything. The Lord has brought you here. Uh, and the Lord is growing you and he's doing a work in your life. It's his garden and he's the gardener. And all we have to do is reap the harvest. So that's the theme of today's readings. Now, uh, I want to give you all a very warm welcome, and especially we have special guests here today. Uh, my, my dear our friend, uh, Dr. Lester Chen and Dr. Melissa Tien from Singapore. You've read about them uh, in the um, bulletin, and they're both going to be sharing uh, something of their testimony with us today. And also, they're uh, lovely and intelligent and gorgeous children, uh, Isaac and Lauren. Can we give them all a very, very warm welcome to that church? Come on, let's give them a very warm welcome. Thank you. Now, um, I didn't look around and say, who could I invite? Uh, Lester said, we want to come and visit. So uh, I had nothing to do with that. They, they brought themselves here. They paid their own airfares. So we've got a free gift. This is a blessing that they're here to share with us today. Isn't that lovely? Would you all please welcome them? And let's go around and bring one another and say, good morning and welcome to church. Let's find someone to say good morning to. Shake a hand and welcome to the meeting. Oh, 
let's stir up our spirits. Let's show some enthusiasm. The word, the word enthusiasm is from two Greek words. En meaning in, and theos meaning God. So be enthusiastic is to have God in your heart. Let's worship enthusiastically this morning. Amen? Okay, lead us away. Let's try
joy of the Lord is his strength. The joy of the Lord is his strength. The joy of the Lord is his strength.
that has set us free from our own life and from sin, to be free to serve you and to walk with you, to enjoy your presence. We just we love you, Jesus. Lord, Holy Spirit of Christ, we welcome you. Come, fall upon us, strengthen us, fill our hearts afresh with joy today. Especially at this season of the year, as teachers and students are tired at the end of the year, as we prepare for holidays and for refreshment, uh, we just ask that you would be our strength, Lord, at this time. And uh, carry us through with all our responsibilities, and all our, the things we have to deal with. Give us your strength and your peace day by day. In your name we pray, Amen. We join together in this college of theme prayer for the fourth Sunday in Pentecost. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let's pray together. All the Christ God, God, King, King of the Lord, Lord, your household and church, in your steadfast love and faith, that through your grace we may proclaim your truth with boldness, and minister your justice with compassion. For the sake of our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God. Now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the first reading from the Old Testament, which is a read to us today by Doreen. And you'll notice, you'll notice that all the readings, except for the Epistle, which is always a separate series, uh, all the readings are about God's garden and how we are God's planting, God's forest, or God's garden. Thank you, Doreen. And to the melody of the heart. 
For you have made me glad by your hands, O Lord, and I shout for joy because of the works of your hands. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree, and shall spread abroad like a cedar of Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be green and succulent, that they may show how upright the Lord is, my rock, in whom there is no fault. Then I say this bit, glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, and you reply, As yes, it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Again, we are God's planting, God's tree. We're going to have the second reading now, the epistle reading, which is read to us by Heaven Lane.
and standing for the gospel of the Lord. We sing Alleluia to welcome the words of Jesus with joy. Testimony of an experience. It must, must be really brief, guys. No five minute testimony. It's just 
30 seconds or something, a minute, come up and just say something where you felt attacked, but God turned it around. Or something was difficult, but God worked it out for good. Does anybody have a 30 seconds? I know that's very specific, but it's leading into this song that the music team is going to sing for us. It's not a worship song, it's a performance song, they're going to sing it to us, and it's to remind us that the battle belongs to the Lord, the victory is God. Does anybody have a 30 second testimony? This is not how we're going to go Yeah, all right, Michelle, wonderful, thank you. A bit risky when you do this, you know, I'm always bit nervous. So thank you for coming forward. Good morning, Church. Um, my father was recently sick, and um, he was in the his uh, operation this Friday. Uh, this meal was terrible for me at the very beginning, but um, I want to take this opportunity to thank the church, especially the prayer group, to pray for my dad. And his operation was very successfully done, and I hope that he will um, recover. And I think that uh, I see God's grace in this, all, uh, in this uh, period of time, although this is a very difficult time for our family, but I, I really see that God has done a lot um, in this process. And I uh, just wanted to ask church to never stop praying. Is there one, one person you can share with us? Is there one with me that uh, He seek the most um, uh, appropriate uh, treatment for him uh, himself. Because he, there is a lot of options for him, that, but he doesn't want to, to do that. Uh, and uh, I think uh, after we praying for him, then he keeps seeking for the doctors and he found one that is really um, good for him. And after the surgery, he feels very good. Is he resistant to that treatment? Uh, no, 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 no. He wants to seek treatment, but the one that he wants. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Thanks be to God. Thank you very much. experience where, you know, something seemed evil or it seemed to be uh, a bit overwhelming and God worked it for good, or you felt under attack and it turned out, well, does anybody have a testimony like that? Give you a moment to think. Anybody? Be brave. Anybody have any other testimony you'd like to share? Something that you feel thankful for? Behind you. Okay. Well, thank you. Oh, the singer is going to share. That's good. I like that. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so, my sister, she isn't here right now. However, um, she is sick. Uh, she has depression, anxiety, and some other things. Um, and when we first found out, it was really, really devastating for our whole family. My mom basically kind of uh, blamed it on herself that she couldn't do better. Um, and I was trying to be strong and to anger both my mom and, the situ and my sister in the situation. Um, and it's been over a year now since uh, we found out about it and I really am thanking God for giving my family patience and kindness to help my sister in ways that she needs and I'm really thankful that uh, she came to church uh, before for a brief moment of time and uh, I'm just really glad that she's doing a lot better than when she first uh, started having her illnesses and Um, my grandpa recently got an injury, so we have to take care of him like 24 7. So someone has to be at the house all the time. So both your mom and your sister came to church out of that time. Mm. And she's doing better now. A lot better. Another blessing was the support from friends. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for speaking to me. Sometimes when we go through difficulties in life, that's actually when God teaches us things and when we pray. Is there one more? One more person who would like to share something? Yes. Oh! Andrew is here. Oh! Hello! How oh, wonderful. This is, uh, I'll let them introduce myself. I don't think
He is so cute, isn't he? He's like the cutest baby. It's so lovely to see. Yeah, we were so worried about Chocho and he had the disease. Sounds like you're turning into a motorcycle, doesn't it? Sounds like a motorcycle. All right, let's um, please remain seated. And um, Eric, are you still there? Would you please uh, enjoy uh, and receive this ministry as uh, and Chris, you can go for it, as we listen to this song, the weapon, uh, uh, we will see a victory.
my parents might have been Pentecostal preachers when I was younger, but I'm not thoroughly Anglican. And I've always been suspicious of victorious Christianity, so-called victorious Christianity, because people get sick and people die and people get cancer and, and bad things happen to good people. But I think what the scripture, this, this verse, this song, is based on multiple Bible verses. And, and we, we saw that in the readings last week, that we are involved in spiritual warfare. The enemy is prowling around to, to see who he can bring down. And I really believe that this is the, the lesson that God brings victory out of defeat. He brings life out of death. He brings sorrow, he brings joy out of sorrow. He brings healing out of sickness. God, God is in the business of bringing life. And uh, in this world, we still live in the valley of the shadow of death. But we believe in the final victory of, of Christ. And so we see not only the victories that we look for in this life, but the victory of going home in the age to come. Amen? Now, before the children go and we sing them out, we don't have a greeting of peace on Friendship Sunday because it goes with preparation for communion. But today is Father's Day, and I think we need to give all the fathers lots of hugs, don't you think? We don't have many fathers, but they're very, very precious people. So uh, I want us to give a look around and there's a whole lot of fathers around. Now some of us are, are spiritual fathers like me. I'm not a little, I was a father, a little father for about three weeks, I was once. Um, but uh, we are spiritual fathers and some of us, are, many of us are literal fathers. But would you please greet one another with a greeting of peace in a moment so ladies also greet each other. But especially find the dads and give them a hug and say happy Father's Day. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Happy Father's Day, dads.
the beaches. We left here and the beaches and the city. All right, uh, please be seated. Well, I'm not sure who's going to go first. Um, so, uh, Lester's first, is he? Not ladies first? Okay. All right. So, um, I think the ladies should go first, no? Because yours is brief, oh, okay. All right. Um, so, uh, anyway, it's a great joy to welcome uh, Dr. Lester Chan and Lynn Wilson uh, with us. You already know who they are. And um, I have to say, I haven't paid Lester to say any nice things he says. I actually didn't know what he was going to say. And he said lots of nice things this morning at 9 o'clock. So, um, thank you for that, Lester. Uh, but I didn't know, like, he just said, we're, we're coming to become out for a holiday and, and we'd like to come. And I said, oh, you know, would you share your testimony? Because he did 10 years ago. He came and shared a church and his group on Friendship Sunday. And uh, he said he had some new things to share. So that's wonderful. Um, but uh, in the in, in, uh, interest of full confession, uh, Lester and I are very old friends going back uh, 31 years, I think. Um, and uh, we, were, we were in a news group together. And uh, he's now a 43-year-old uh, adjunct professor um, of oncology or something. Um, he'll still explain it better than me. Um, but I met him when he was a little guy in, in Sunday school, I and mean, in youth group. And uh, I, I never forget uh, Lester and his younger brother, Ed. And he, he was 13 and I think it was about 11. And uh, things were pretty tough at home, as I think you'll share with you in his testimony. Uh, by the way, this is going on Facebook, but I don't think many people watch it, so don't worry too much. Um, and, um, and, then, and then we're having a tough time, and we had, as we do at the end of youth group, we had a prayer time. And I was with them in a little triplet praying. And uh, I was so touched because I said, what do you guys want to pray for? And they said, we want to pray for our dad. And they prayed this, especially Lester prayed this, but Ed also, they prayed these beautiful prayers for their dad. And it was very touching because David was sort of the last, the last person that you'd ever think would come to Christ. Uh, you know, in church we pray for people to come to Christ and we pray for years and years and nothing seems to happen. And it was a bit like that. And um, the boys prayed for him so touchingly. And, I, and it was really hard to believe that their prayer would be answered. And a couple of years later we had a church outreach dinner at a restaurant. And then we had a speaker, some speakers, some testimonies. And, uh, and Lester's dad, David, came forward and gave his life to Christ. And you know, whenever that happens, you, we always wonder, do they mean it? Will they, will they persevere? Will they give up in a year or two years? And um, I think he had ups and downs, but he's still going to church now. This is um, 28 years later or something, 27 years later. David is still serving the Lord and actually very enthusiastic and joyful when you meet him about it. So that's a minor little testimony in my introduction. Would you please give a very warm welcome to Dr. Leslie Chen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Just give me a second to get myself set up here and put on the timer so that I don't uh, accept your overrun. So someone has to take this so they can move the slides forward. Okay, yeah, that's fine. So, uh, Morning everybody, and it's, uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. We had a chance to hang out with your kids yesterday at the youth group, and, uh, and I've got a couple of slides here to just introduce myself. Um, I, I'm Lester, I'm uh, by profession, I'm a doctor, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, I work in Singapore, and uh, these are my, this is my family. You can see them uh, sort of blown up big here. Isaac's 15, Laura is 12. Um, Melissa, my beautiful wife, and uh, uh, Steve gave me 30 minutes, so only gave Melissa 10, but we can sort of reach it back if you, if you want, darling. Um, <laughs> Melissa is, uh, I don't know, she's a, a wonderful wife, and uh, God knows exactly what you need. She's beautiful, intelligent, uh, far more capable, and, and tough, and sturdy than I am, and I, God knew that I knew I needed someone like that to to help me and support me and stop me from uh, losing my head if it wasn't screwed up. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they, they say that behind every successful man is a surprise wife. And that's probably true. I'm wondering if one of those says that they... The ladies are clapping for that. So, um, 
this is our dog, who unfortunately is not allowed to fly over here and do this. The hospital that both Melissa and I work in. It's a busy government hospital and we work in jobs. Uh, it was in the neuro ophthalmology department, the ophthalmology department, and sort of somewhere around between brain and eye, especially neuro ophthalmology, uh, orthopedics, which is bones, joints, fractures, and I sub specialize in cancer surgery, four bones and joints, and, um, and those are jobs which I feel God has called us to be in, and there's a little bit of story about how we ended up there. Uh, next slide. Yeah, this is, this is, for me, this is the team that I've been sort of trend, it sort of changes a bit. This is last Christmas. I attended our Christmas party and invite people around to our house. And, um, and this is sort of the, the people that I work with on, on a daily basis. Uh, I think that's the last slide. Oh, no, one more. Um, so this is, uh, this is a, a slide showing the 1990s when I first met Steve, um, and these are some of the youth camps. If you look at the top uh, left-hand picture, right at the back, the guy in the middle, taller than everybody else, uh, that's Steve. And two to the three to the right is me with Kurt, Kurt hairstyle, which was all the rage those days. Um, and, and you know, I remember being a, a, a 13 year old and being Steve and being part of that youth group in the way that my kids are now, and I remember Steve baptized me when I was 15, praise God. Isaac is 15, he got baptized about a month ago. And uh, side note, I got baptized in a coffin. And, which, we're we're not sure like, about that. <laughs> we're, we're pretty convinced it was a coffin. And, and because the, the church panning hall that normally people got baptized in had broken down, and by some providence of the Lord, uh, he picked up this box. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I have to get so I, I had just did that episode before I realized I, I didn't have a pool for the baptism. And the pool in church had gone missing or broken or something. And so I was praying for the Lord to provide. I didn't know how to find a, a pool. And, uh, and I was driving along and there was a laptop point by the side of the road. And there was this perfect box. It was about six feet long. It was about wide and about three feet thick. I thought, that's perfect. So I, I was, and it was clean pine wood, and I thought, okay, thank you, Lord. So I took it home, and I painted it with latex paint, uh, white paint. And then I, I very proudly brought it to church, and this was great. And then somebody said, I think that's a coffin. <laughs> I, I'm still not sure it was. It might have been a packing frame. Yeah, yeah. But there was suspiciously a crematorium about a quarter of a mile. But I don't think you should be because you know, uh, the, the coffin is you know, a symbol of death, well, not a symbol, it's a, it's a practical revival of people's life. You know, when you're baptized in the coffin, there's a deep spiritual significance about how you get to your life. And I love it. That, that, that phrase. It only lasted one baptism. Yeah. It's fine for me, and then it was never used again. So I feel incredibly privileged to have been baptized by Steve. Do you have photos? It, it's all on the. Uh, there are hard copy photos. My mother has them, uh, but they're not digitalized. So I, I need some of those. those photos. we got to get those. Yeah. And so, so this is the background I have. Uh, and, and I'm really here because of a great love for Steve. And uh, he was my pastor in Charlton Church. Uh, 93 to 98, and uh, I see Steve by every once every 10 years. So he was he flew over to London for our wedding. That was in 2005. Um, when I finished my specialist training, I said I really want to see Steve, and I came over to the canal. I, I couldn't bring the kids at the time, um, but he gave me the opportunity to, to share my testimony and really the story of how my family became Christians, and a lot about the story of my father and the difficult relationship I had with him the prayers that we prayed for him and how he became a Christian. And I remember just sort of dovetailing into what he was sharing. I don't know if you, I think a lot of people have difficulties with their fathers. It's ironic because this is Father's Day. But 
you know, I love my father, and I know my father loves me, but we had such a difficult relationship at that time, and we would go head to head, and we would pray that he was the last person in our family to become a Christian, and we thought it was never going to happen, even though we prayed for him, because he was such a stubborn, hard person. Um, and I think that you're watching this, <laughs> you know, the Lord works in, um, you know, when you look at your Facebook, you suddenly have this realization you never get what you see. But, you know, through the years, the Lord just worked on my father. Where you think, is anything too difficult for the Lord? And you think theoretically, no. But then you look at your, your dad, who was very stubborn in the day. And you thought, well, you know, but God doesn't work on our task scales. You know, and He has ways of leading people through things which gradually soften and change and mold them. And my dad is a faithful Christian, and I believe with all my heart that he loves the Lord and that the Lord knows him and um, that he was he was really converted. You know, the night that my mom came back from that dinner, she thought it important enough to wake up, at least myself, maybe my brother, and he woke up and said, Dad's become a Christian. And I remember waking up, I actually remember that night thinking, are you sure? <laughs> you know, because it's such a monumental thing. My dad had always been so resistant to it. Um, but by God's grace, he, he really did become a Christian. And his, he didn't change overnight, but over the years, things, things changed. So I wasn't intending to share about that, but that's just a little side note. Um, you know, I, I heard about Steve and, and his testimony of having tongue cancer and how... God led it through that, and um, I thought I, I have to see Steve this year, and I, I really wanted to come and to. And, and I, we were really struggling at the beginning of the year, trying to look for the time of the year and when we could do it. And I sort of planned to have a beach holiday somewhere around this time. And Bliss and I were talking about it, we were trying to work out where we were going to go and make the plans, but nothing sat right, and there was nothing we could agree upon. And I, I think it was just the Holy Spirit at that point saying to us, you know, no, this is where you're supposed to go. And uh, we had a servant church from uh, Philippians 2. And Philippians 2 is about Paul making his plans. Yeah, he wants to go uh, see the Philippians. And he's going to send, he's in prison, I think, and he's sending Timothy and Epaphroditus to minister to the church. And he wants to go as well. And the sermon was about making our plans guided by God and how He guides us these, to these things. And this is a bit of what we were thinking about this. And I really felt that that time God was impressing on the heart. This is the time He's supposed to go to um, Hong Kong, Macau, and see Steve. And I talked to Melissa about it. And we just had this piece about it. We just thought that this is right. This is what we should do. And uh, so, so here we are in Macau. Um, you know, really wanting to bless Steve and, and the church, and also just being incredibly blessed by being here. So, so thank you for it, um, welcoming us, and thank you, Steve, for giving me this opportunity to share my testimony. Sorry, God, for reading into your time as well. Um, you know, uh, so, so I became a Christian at age seven, um, watching a pop star named Cliff Richard, some of you all might know who Cliff Richard is, he's a pop star who never seemed to get old, you know, from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and 90s, and my mom had just become a Christian, and she brought back this video VHS tape, and it was a Cliff Richard concert, and at the end of the concert, he shares the gospel about how Jesus died for your sins, how he loves you, how he died to, so your sins can be forgiven, so you can be in a relationship with God, you can you know, you can have that relationship with God and create the world and, and all you have to do is believe in Him. You know, accept that His forgiveness and you can be in a relationship with God. And I remember as a seven-year-old watching Cliff Richard and I believed Him. With all my heart, I believed Him and I prayed the prayer that He led me through and I believed that prayer and I decisively became a Christian at that moment, as a seven-year-old in 1987. And my faith has developed a lot since then, you know, the complexity of thought and the ideas you had and all the various debates and, 
and so on and so forth, you know, they get more complex in the way you think changes. But that little seed that was planted at that point, by Cliff Richard and others, has not changed. And when I, I, I was thinking about my testimony, and when I saw Steve Sedley did the readings, I just thought there was such a resonance there, you know, about the mustard seed, and about how you know, that tiny little thing, which is, uh, if you see a mustard seed, it's really tiny, you know, um, and that's that's how faith comes into our lives. You know, it's it's small, but it's real, and it changes the trajectory of your life and where you're, and where you're going. Um, so, so that was age seven. Um, I've been a Christian since age seven. That's not everybody's story. If people come to faith in different ways and have different experiences. That's my, that, that's how I became a Christian. Um, we moved to Hong Kong in 1993. Uh, my dad was a bridge engineer for the Chima Bridge. Back then it was uh, it was the old uh, Calgary Airport and um, then they built that big bridge over there and then there was the new Lantau Airport. Um, so I grew up in Shakti Church and these really were my formative years. Um, just, just to think about the structure of what I'm doing with this. So I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about this, I'm going to follow the mustard seed thing. And the first bit of what I'm sharing about is the, uh, it is the planting and the watering of the mustard seed. So that planting and watering phase. And the next bit is about the pruning. Because that's a bit of my story about how God has pruned away. And that pruning is a really painful process sometimes. And, but God is doing things to you. So pruning is a gardening thing where you cut back a plant and in order to make it more fruitful, in order to bring forth more fruit and better growth and for the health of the plant. And then the last thing is about that sort of result of having this tree, having this plant. And the tree is this analogy of a place of life and growth and shelter and all of these wonderful gospel things that happen in this, this tree. So that's what we're going for the, um, the planting and watering, the pruning, and the fruit and the result of that tree. So, so we're still in the watering bit. So that bit in uh, Hong Kong, where I met Steve, and I was um, under his preaching and teaching and guidance and other people in the church and the youth group, and, um, and I learned so much about what it meant to be a Christian at that time. And Steve would, uh, would invite people, and they would have some of these ex-tribe members from, uh, from Jackie Pollinger's ministry, and they would come and they would tell stories about how they would um, you know, slash people with knives, and there would be gang fights, and there would be prostitution, or uh, being addicted to drugs, and how Jesus came into their lives. And, and, and they were new creations, they were different. They became different people. Um, and I learned what it meant to be that the gospel is for everybody. Um, and we had missionaries come, and I remember, and I shared it with the youth. You know, a missionary came and said, You know, I've been following God, and I've got this relationship with God, and God is as real to me as you, as good to me, or as much as you, that as you, He's more real to me than you sitting in front of me. And I thought, That's crazy. You know, how can how can you have a relationship with God when you're so close to Him, you know Him, you trust Him so much that you're more sure of God than you are of, of, of Uncle Steve here or someone else sitting in the in, in your seats. And but that is something that as I went through life, I realized, wow, as I had this growing faith, that well, God is 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 real. He is and more sure than physical things. We'll come back to that. Um, so that was Hong Kong. And that was part of this growing phase. And then I went to medical school and then Melissa there. Um, you know, we, uh, at medical school, when you leave home, that's a real test of time. Actually. You leave and you've got freedom and you can go. You don't have parents looking over you. Um, and God is not looking over you. Um, but it was a time where I pressed into things, and I wanted to, you know, I would be 
went to debates and you heard arguments and you pressed your faith and you looked at other world religions and you sort of tried to figure out is this, I mean, I, I knew actually that I had this relationship with Jesus, but I wanted to press into this thing because if Jesus is real, you don't have to be worried about asking questions. It's not going to fall apart. You, know? you can ask questions about evolution, you can ask questions about, um, you know, where we came from, morality, other world religions, and you meet all of you read all of these great Christian thinkers, and that was a real time of learning and deepening roots and and growing in faith. And I believe God was leading me through that time to um, you know through this period of watering and growth through Steve. Uh, you know the internet was up at that time. Uh, not to know the advent of the internet. And you could listen to all of these amazing preachers from around the world, you know, the John Pipers, the Tim Kellers, all the famous people who were coming on the scene. And, you know, for all of you guys, I mean, for my kids who are young here, if you're not sure about Jesus, if you're not sure about um, Christianity, just press into it, ask and look for the truth. And whatever's true, it's not going to fall down if you press on it. Not just because my dad says so either. Um, so I was engaged in medical studies and I sort of became a doctor because, not because I had this great wonderful idea that I'd become a doctor, but because my dad thought it would be a good idea. And I had good grades. And uh, so I went into medicine. But as I was going through all of this formative years, I started thinking, I actually want to be a, you know, I hear all these great pastors and preachers and I saw how powerful their words were. I thought, I'd love to be a preacher. I'd love to be a pastor. Um, but at various points in my life, God just closed the door on that. And uh, I remember one particular point that I had joined Redemption Hill Church, which is the church I'm still at at the moment. And Isaac was about you know, just born, I think. Um, he's the same age as the church. Um, and the church had grown to about 100 people in about six months. It was continuing to grow. And Simon, who was the lead pastor, he asked me, you know, Lester, do you want to come and join the church? You, you know, and I was not on the training program at that point. I tried twice to get into an orthopedic surgery program, which is very competitive, and I failed. And I came back and I talked to Melissa and I said, uh, you know, Simon's asked me to join the church, and I'm quite enthusiastic about it. You know. And uh, and Melissa said, no, I, uh, I don't think that's right for you. I, thought, I think she also said, I don't think I'm going to be a pastor's wife. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, I'll tell you, you know, when, if, you're, if God's calling you to something, you pray about it as a couple, and I really do mean it. Melissa is, I mean, she is one of the wisest, kindest, uh, you know, most wonderful people I've, you know, and she is the most wonderful person I've ever known. Um, and I don't remember ever getting bad advice from her. You know, so so honor your wives, I just want to honor my wife this morning. Um, I forgot to honor my wife, by the way, in my wedding speech. So so take that warning from me, honor your wives, guys. Okay. And she she didn't have a piece about it. And when I looked at it, I thought, I prayed about it, and we prayed about it, and we said, if God, if you give me this fourth peak training position, that's, maybe that's, that's, that's a sign for me, right? And so, lo and behold, I, the third time around, I got the fourth peak training position, which I actually wasn't sure I wanted, by the way, but I prayed about it, and God put me into this thing. And, um, and that is the start of this period, I think, of pruning. Um, because when, Back in those days, uh, when you were a junior doctor, there were no, nowadays there's working time restrictions, there's certain things you can and can't do um, for the working hours. Um, you have to give them an adequate, uh, junior doctors an adequate amount of rest. Uh, you have to supervise them for various different things. Back then, that wasn't really happening. They just threw you in the deep end and you sort of survived what you did. And, uh, and I was in that period of time and uh, I was sleep deprived at work, and uh, Isaac is my son, and he, he was very active at that time, and I was sleep deprived at home. And I had a couple of complications of surgery, and 
things didn't seem like they were going well. And I started thinking, I didn't really want to do this job, actually. I sort of wanted to become a pastor or a preacher. And maybe I made this terrible mistake six months ago. And I thought, I'm very terrible to I need to do something about it. I need to get out. And I need to get, you know, take some evasive action. But the problem was that every time I did, there was no peace about it. And every time I asked for counsel, or I read somebody's um, advice or a sermon, the answer was always the same. Stay where you are. Be faithful with what you've been given, and don't move until God tells you to. And I remember there was one time I was, uh, you, know, you know, every time I thought, oh, I'm being over-spiritual about it, I'm thinking too hard about it, God would send a person and say, I've got this message for you, you've got to stay where you are and be faithful. And I thought, no, that is not what I need right now. You know, I need to get out of this career that I really don't like and it's not going well. And we had friends who flew from the UK, and we weren't supposed to be able to meet them, but suddenly, you know, work finished early for both of us, we managed to meet them. I went to the hotel room, um, you know, and they asked, oh, how are you doing? I said, oh, you know, I'm miserable, I'm depressed, I want to get out of this job. And the guy turns around and says to me, but I've had the same struggle as you for three years, and God said clearly to me, you don't move. Don't, you stay where you are, you be faithful to God. And I thought, oh, you know, I'm really in trouble now, because I was so miserable depressed at this point. I was like a shell of myself because I had been fighting with God every day. And, um, and, and, and Lizzie could tell you that, uh, you know, how, how difficult that time was. But there came a day where I thought, God, I, I can't fight with you anymore. And if this is really what you're calling me to do, then I give up. I, I die to myself, as it were, and I feel like if I stay in this job, which is so stressful, and I don't think I'm going to be good at it, and I think I'm going to be miserable, I'm miserable for the last six months, and I think I'm going to be miserable for the, the rest of my life if I stay in this course, but if you are calling me to do this, then I'm going to give up fighting, and I'm just going to be faithful, and I'm going to do it, and I gave everything to God at that point. And the second I did, it was like a weight lifted from me. And that depression lifted, and that season ended, and I was a different person within about two weeks. Now, now I'm, I'm careful to say that not everyone's experience of depression is like that. And I've been through other seasons of depression, and it's a little bit more complicated as a whole, but that was that season for me. And you know, there was something there in that season where God was proving. And God was, was cutting away things like pride and self-reliance and this youthful confidence that I was invincible and I could do anything. And teaching me that there were times where I'm going to be out of my depth and I need to trust in Him, I need to rely on Him. Even when things are out of my control, I needed to walk that road with me and say that even if things are out of my control, because I didn't realize I like things to be out of control until things were out of control. In that storm, you need to trust in God. You can't learn that until you walk through that storm. Um, so, so that was my, at least one of the periods of pruning. There are a lot of periods of pruning I should get to. Someone like me is what we've done on days. Listen to you, that's part of your testimony later. Um, so, you know, um, I, I guess this career in medicine, I don't think it really matters what you do, whether you're a doctor, whether you're a pastor, whether you're a teacher, whether you're um, you know, whichever profession, whether you're a, a, a domestic helper, you know, God calls us all to different places. And I think it's, you know, the actual occupation you do is just the context. Um, but it's when you're walking with God in those situations. And so, so that was, you know, that was me coming to the end of myself 
giving life to raise God, giving my life to God, really giving it to God. I sort of give things to God when I was seven, but I sort of had to give it again to Him um, at various different points, including this point of giving you know, the, my future and my career and what I was going to do. Um, and, um, you know, uh, so, so right now, I, God led me into this career which is called orthopedic oncology. It's bones and soft tissue tumors and cancers. And sometimes you get to cure people of their cancers. Some people you, sometimes you can't, but you're there to, uh, to care for them. You're there to walk alongside them. And I've found that, um, that God, it feels like God has just cut out this Leicestershire job where this is where I'm supposed to be. You know, this is where the skills that I've been given and the type of person I am. And, um, and I can't think of a place I would be happier than doing the work I'm doing right now. But I couldn't see that at that time when I was depressed and wondering what I was going to do and wanting to be a pastor. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of our struggles happen when we when we look to ourselves and we trust in our own ability, um, or when we're overwhelmed and we start doubting our own ability. Um, but actually, the Christian opposite of self-doubt is not self-confidence. The Christian opposite of self-doubt is faith in God. You know, it's not being believing in yourself. It's not having high self-esteem. It's knowing that you have a God on your side who walks with you who will help you, who will give you what you need even if you don't have it in yourself. And just walking with you through that. And um, so as, uh, you know, I've had a few more things to say about how God just provided all the stuff I needed along the way. You know, even I felt I was out of my depth. I wanted to start this cancer service. I wasn't sure how to do all of these things. I had a mentor who was an incredible surgeon who just helped me through all of these steps, who happened to be a, a sold-out Christian and a lovely guy and incredibly technically, but who would always be there for me. You know, I needed a pathologist to help read the slides. It's very hard to find people in the hospital who want to take off extra work to do something you want to do. But, you know, a, a pathologist popped up who was the most health, helpful pathologist I've ever met. You know. um, some of the doctors here may know that pathologists tend to be very introverted people who don't like to talk to other people. But I found the most helpful pathologists that God provided. You know, an international radiologist, and our oncology department is swapped all the time. So to say, I'm going to start up uh, this niche sarcoma service, which is going to add to your workload, you know, it's, it's a crazy ask. But God just provided this oncologist who had sarcoma background and was interested. You know, God has just opened the doors for many things. And he has closed the door to some things as well. And often I feel like, you know, I look back and oh, that was a project that I wanted to do because I wanted to be a big name or I wanted to be well known for this thing. But God sometimes just closes those doors because they're not good for us. One of the biggest problems I think with being a doctor is that, you know, or, or being uh, you know, in any of these sort of competitive things is pride. And I think God does things that that, um, that, that will cover away those things, that pride. All right, I'm going to quickly wrap up because I need to give time for this. So, over the last 20 years, I have made a few observations. Number one, we actually have no idea what's good for us, uh, but God does. Uh, he's got a plan. It's better than the plans that we have for ourselves. I have no idea I will be an orthopedic surgeon, an oncology surgeon, do all sorts of interesting surgeries. God has not called all of us to be vocational. Number two, not, God has not called all of us to be vocational pastors or preachers, but He has called us all to follow Him in our various spheres of life. And it's not as important what job you do, but whether you're walking with God in it. And we're called to love those around us, no matter what we, uh, what we're called to do. Um, one of my favorite verses is "Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you." And I look back at all the times where I've had trouble is when I started seeking the kingdom of Leicester before I started seeking the kingdom of God. You know, I tried to build my own kingdom, my own brand, my own name. And God just 
wouldn't let me do that. You know, so he gave me trouble, he gave me problems until I went back to Lord, Lord, I'll seek your kingdom first, and I'm not going to worry about all of these things. And then he just takes care of all of that stuff. You know? um, not being a pastor, not being a preacher, has opened doors for me for the gospel in places where pastors and preachers do not get to go. Into people's lives, not just patients, but colleagues as well. I think if you live with Jesus, if you live for something that's different from the rest of the world, people will want to lie. Um, I've had the opportunity to go to conference and conferences and overseas fellowships and have you know, people like as diverse as a Japanese orthopedic surgeon and his, uh, you know, we prayed for them because they were having difficulty. Um, has, uh, you know, having children, and and he told me all this medical story about how he had all these tests, and it was practically impossible for them to have children. And this uh, Japanese surgeon said, Oh, we're going to pray for you. And we prayed for him, and he went back to Japan, and his wife got pregnant the next month. And then he came back to the place where we were doing the fellowship together, and he said, I want to come to church. And uh, because in their culture, they go to the temple and they give an offering, and, uh, you know, and when it, if the thing happens, then they go back and they need to, to give that offering. And I say, that's not actually how God works, that's not how Jesus works, and I explained the gospel to him. Now, he didn't become a Christian, and I was still praying for him, but God is just opening doors into these places where, you know, Jack, Japan is the most unchurched one of the most unchurched countries in the world. And now I've got close friends there who I meet on a regular basis. And I'm praying to those situations. And I'm praying to those things. And I have no idea whether seed will fruit or not, but I can't do anything about it. That's God's work. I'm just here to sow seed. And, you know, this reading is about the mustard seed today. And if you listen, Jesus, and if you hear his voice, um, that little mustard seed is there, and God is going to, you, know, you just have to let that seed sink in, and then there's this process of watering, and there's this process of growing, and then there's this process of pruning, and if you allow God to do all these things in your life, he will bring up a tree. And a few years ago, when I was setting up my, mus my muscular state of tumor team as an alpha, I had this picture in my mind that this team, that this spirit of influence that I was doing, that I was setting up, was going to be a place where it was like a muscle tree that you know, different nurses and doctors and allied health staff and they were part of this team. And I wanted it to be this place where people would be loved and supported and there would be this gospel atmosphere um, of all the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which I wanted to see come through in me. Uh, one of the dangers of growing old is you become a grumpy old man. Right? And uh, this is very careful to warn me about that when it happens. Um, but you know those gospel fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, uh, gentleness, self-control, they don't automatically happen. The automatic thing that happens is you get older, you become a grumpy old man. And when you become a certain, you become less patient, you become less tolerant of things, you become more fixed in your ways and more stubborn. That's the natural history of the surgeon, actually. Um, but I didn't want to be that. I wanted to be, have the Holy Spirit in me, and I wanted where I was and where I had was to be a place that reflected that. And I, I hope that by God's grace and by His continual pruning, because I need pruning all the time, because sin is popping up, things popping up, selfish ambition is popping up here, I need God to be continually working in my life through various sometimes painful processes. Um, so, so I just want to close with that. Um, that if you are here and maybe you're not Christian, but you feel that somehow there is that seed which is being planted in you 
if you're not sure if you want to take that plunge and commit to this thing, um, I want to say it is a wonderful thing to be in the loving care of our Heavenly Father. And if you let that seed go into your heart, then you know, it will produce some, some wonderful things. Um, you know, and it will take time. It takes time to grow a tree. And it takes time to be nurtured. And, um, you know, I had the joy of being a 13 year old kid in uh, Steve's under Steve's tree, as it were, under his, uh, his, his sphere of influence, where um, he ministered to me, he watered that, he proved that, and I was in that shelter, in that safety, and he has such a loving pastoral heart. Um, I mean, you guys are so blessed to have him here with you. He's not a perfect man by any, by any stretch of the imagination, but he has loved me and generations of people of, of people in his care and in his church, and he really does love you. Um, and I would have been under that tree, and I hope that as I grow, that my own little tree, which is starting from the root of Jesus, you know, and there are many trees around the world, that grows into a strong tree, and it's a, it's a tree where there's love, and there's life, and there's joy, and there's peace, and there's kindness in a world which is full of darkness. You know? And I hope for my kids that that seed of the gospel grows into their lives. So that as they grow, when they come back, which is in the staff of nine, 40 years later, they look back on their lives and think, wow, that faith has taken root. Now I've got this tree, and now I'm loving people and I'm caring for them with the gospel. And, you know, there are so many uh, ways that we can work this out. And I was reflecting this morning as I was at Morrison Chapel that often we don't get to see the fruit of our Christian ministry. We don't often get to see what happens to those seeds that we plant out, that we throw out. Um, but sometimes we do. Sometimes we get to see God's work and the things that we've sort of invested our time and our energy and our love into come back and, and you know, maybe you see a kid from your youth group and now he's serving the Lord in whatever profession he's in and he's He's, he's caring and he's, he's loving people with the gospel and he's making more disciples for Jesus who are also doing that. We have no idea what those seeds will do. And this morning I, I, I chatted at the Morrison Chapel about Robert Morrison and how in his lifetime he saw next to I mean, maybe two or three converts you know, and, and get to his life and he didn't have a mega church, he didn't have people come to faith. He translated the Bible into Chinese. He was the first guy to make an English Chinese dictionary when it was illegal, under great hardship. He translated the scriptures into Chinese and he laid the foundation for Hudson Taylor and the China Inland Mission to evangelize millions of Chinese Christians and bring them from darkness to light. And he did not see any of that during his life. Scholars say over 200 million. Mm -hmm. So 200 million from the scholarly sources. And, and I'm part of that as well. I was at the Chinese Church of London. So you have no idea how God will use your lives and the little humble seeds, the little humble faith that you have, and the little sharing that you share at the Sunday school with a small child and what that effect might have on them. So uh, with that, I will. Thank you all, and um, I'm going to invite Melissa up, um, my beautiful wife. She just wants five minutes. I mean, Melissa is such a capable person. You need um, to stop talking now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> come, 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 come. She's such a lovely capable person. I mean, she's far more able and tough. We got it, we got it, we got it. All right, two more times.
throughout my time with Leicester. And uh, I, just, I think I'm just going to inform you. I think even though we haven't had that personal interaction, I know he is very much the man that he is because of you. Um, Not to say 
uh, well done. He says you are the child that doesn't give me trouble, so that's... <laughs> um, I, I, I grew up, I, I know I'm naturally quite talented. I grew up with perfect, I was born in perfect pitch. I can play anything on the piano, if you, if you just sing it. Um, I was a competitive pianist when I was younger. I've always been academic and bright. Um, unlike Lester, I always knew I wanted to do medicine. And so I'm, I'm very tenacious by nature. I have a lot of grit. Um, I, I have a, these things that can push me through into something. Um, so when things are very hard, I just push myself all the way through. But the problem with that is that it makes your heart hard. hard. You rely a lot on yourself. Um, and I think with my relationship with my father, I learned, I think quite early on, but still learning at the age of 44, that I don't go to my father and I say, the least my problems, counsel me through it, what do you think? Actually, my relationship with my father very much is, okay, I'm just gonna tell you what I've done well, because that's easier, you know, it's, it's a lot easier. But I realized that in some ways, he is very proud of me. In, in the clinic, they took photographs of me because they put them onto brochures for blindness, squints, I don't know what else, and there's this weird photograph of me measuring people with rhythms. And my father actually came to my clinic to see another doctor because he says he can't see his daughter, he doesn't trust his daughter as a doctor, he sees my boss. And he collected all these, all these new pamphlets, and I didn't know this until the other day he told me to go to his house and clear up some stuff, and it was in the drawer. So I know he's proud of me, but you know, all these things don't make you quiet. Quite an anxious person because you're always trying to please someone. You're always trying to, you're always trying to be good at what you do, and that's always going to be the smarter doctor out there. When I go to conferences, I feel so much like an imposter. Like I shouldn't be there, and my poster is not good enough. My research is not good enough. Um, I cannot diagnose as well, and there's always going to be that someone better than you. So all these things make me quite anxious. And I think in the last few years or so, I started to unpack these dysfunctionalities. I recognize my earthly father's tendencies. I recognize where they come from, and I recognize where I come from, and how I view God in that same kind of genre, that it's very transactional, that I should please God, and therefore God is going to do good for me. Actually, that's not the way it is at all. You know, in James, I think, 117, it says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation of shadow uh, due to change, and God does not change. He is not a father whose mood changes, you know, because you have not pleased him. So I think, and this is all because of, you know, the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus says that I can approach God without needing to do well. So I think, I think as Steve was asking me you know, to encourage the doctors and women doctors and so on and so forth, I think you don't have to worry about doing well. Of course, be excellent at your work. And, you know, I take care of 15 residents plus five more trainees. And I keep telling them, and a lot of medical students who write to me constantly because they want to get into training. And very often, it's, it's funny, I found myself in this role because I meet all of them one on one. And whenever the students come to me and they say, how do I get into residency? How am I, how, what, what do you look for in a resident? And I look through their CV and I look at their and I remember most recently there was a boy that came to me and his name is Ezra. And I said to him, your name is Richard Stage. What is your faith? And he says, oh, I'm a Christian. And I said, then I'm not going to tell you how to get to recipe. I'm going to tell you to pray. Because I don't think I can tell you. God is going to tell you where you want to go. And, you know, you can feel you're not good enough for training. You're not, you're not good enough to get into a very competitive program. But I think... Whenever I think these things of myself, there's this really great quote by George MacDonald, a Scottish minister, and it says, I would rather be what God has chosen, has chosen to make me than the most glorious creature that I can think of, or to have been thought about, born in God's thought, and then made by God is the dearest, grandest, the most precious thing in all creation.
So if you feel that God is not your father, on this father's day, he is your father. You are made by him, you are fathered by him. So where does this leave me? This very terrible emotional state. Uh, I, I lean on God the Father, knowing that wherever He needs me is not wrong. It kind of dovetails with what I've been saying. It's actually very exhausting trying to be good and trying to be excellent all the time. But my favorite hymn, and this is the hymn I once sung with my three year old children. Make you notes. Know, <laughs> yeah, make notes. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt His tenderness? Put him in my Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, here by faith in him to dwell. For I know whatever befalls me, Jesus, to the world of things well. And I really thank you, I thank you, Steve, for being a father to us. Because I know he grew up and his relationship with his dad is not good. So thank you for fathering him and happy Father's Day to you. So God bless you all, thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> 
Does anyone who would uh, like a particular person, if you want a particular person to pray for you, um, you can just go and stand with them or near them and they can pray for you, me or Lester or someone else. It's okay, you can choose who prays for you. Or you can talk to them over lunch and ask them to pray for you.
Is there any fathers who want a blessing on their family tree or their business? Or less than the land, which is where it is. He doesn't have to eat first. Father, we thank you that you've been with us today. We thank you for the wits of words and the testimonies and the wisdom that's been shared. We do ask your blessing on all the fathers here today, both literal and spiritual. We thank you for their love, their protection, their nurturing, their teaching. Um, we thank you, Lord, for them. We ask your blessing on all the dads, and all their businesses, and all their families and their children. In your name we pray. Amen. I think if you have children and they've been in Sunday school, they will have a special gift that they've been decorating for Father's Day, so I hope you enjoy the little gift. Let's close um, as we sing. Um, is Stella still here or is she gone away? Sunday school. Selena's in Sunday school, okay. So we don't have our action here. Never mind. Let's sing one way as we close. Thank you. Can we just give the lesser and lesser just another thing? Uh, Isaac and Laura, little clap. Thank you. Thank you for giving up your precious holiday to come and work <laughs> with you with us this morning. I mean, let's praise the Lord and have my life now, actually.
much to the music team today for a wonderful worship. Thank you so much, guys, for being here. Hallelujah. Let us pray for peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. We also want to say thank you, Lord, for the lunch and happy birthday in Melbourne.